Join us today on the Final Hour podcast as we introduce you to special guest from Israel, Ronnie Levy. We interrupt your program to issue a severe warning for an impending emergency making its way to your area. We urge you to be watchmen of the times and to be prepared with the essential knowledge and supplies for the wake of the final hour. Welcome to the Final Hour Podcast, coming to you from the original Living Word Christian Center out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. My name is Jim Hammond. We're so happy to have you today. Um, we have a special guest with us, uh, Mr. Ronnie Levy, a longtime friend. Um, I've just, every tour I've ever taken to Israel um, has been with him heavily involved and um, we, you know, we'll talk about that at the end uh, with this next tour. But um, uh, 25 years ago, um, I've known him for 25 years. Um, uh, Ronnie's born and raised in Israel, served uh, in the Israeli army as an infantry commander and participated in the Lebanon war uh, and other many other operations. Ronnie has many years teaching and speaking in Christian and Jewish communities across America. In 1994, Ronnie was amongst the leaders of the effort to save the Golan Heights from being given, just given away to Syria. And we're going to talk about that today on the show. And he was also a candidate for the Knesset um, and a personal advisor to Prime, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon on Jewish, world Jewish and world Christian affairs. We're also going to talk about that um, today. Ronnie is the chairman of uh, Building Israel, a nonprofit that we here at Living Word support, which is helping the el elderly with food delivery. But also, Ronnie is a man with a mission. Today, he's leading a national initiative throughout Israel to end the Palestinian conflict and bring complete uh, sovereignty to the communities of Judea and Samaria. Hello, Ronnie. It's so Hello. great to have you here. Nice welcome to be here. Thank welcome you. to the Final Hour Podcast. Thank and you. we'll just get right into it. Um, I'd like to start by asking you about the, the hunger strike you were part of in the Golan Heights. Tell us about this incredible grassroots movement you were a part of. Yeah. Well, it was in 94. Uh, I was a lot younger. I was 30. And uh, the hunger strike was an effort that uh, I led with uh, 11 other guys. With, there were 12 of us. We were the leadership of the effort to save the Golan Heights. Many people may remember that uh, we had a dear prime minister, it's Haq Rabin, but we didn't agree with everything he did or wanted to do. And uh, he had a, a very, um, he was determined to negotiate peace with Syria that is based on Israel giving away the Golan Heights and uh, letting the Syrian army uh, almost to the Sea of Galilee. And that, create a very, that created a very big outrage in Israel because people were worried uh, not only about the idea that uh, it does not correspond with our claim of ownership into that land. You know, the Golan Heights is a part of biblical and ancient Israel. Uh, the Golan Heights is full of uh, ancient synagogues and Jewish remnants over centuries and centuries before Syria, before even Islam. And uh, one of the most uh, frustrating things, I think, for us Israelis is to keep on arguing that we've been there from time immemorial. Uh, now, of course, uh, the audience on a program like that know that, and they knew that since they were children. And I believe that everybody knows that. But the international and diplomatic community has a different uh, way of looking at things, which is uh, trying to take that land away from us. And we went on a, on a it was a two and a half year long campaign. The climax of it was the hunger strike. And in that hunger strike, uh, which looked very uh, unpromising in the first few days, even almost pathetic, uh, turned to be a great success, and within days, uh, we had a pilgrimage of tens of thousands of Israelis that came up to Gamla, the ancient site in the Golan Heights, where we parked for 19 days of a vigil, 
and they came to support us and pray with us and uh, and many of the left wing camp and many of Itzhak Rabin's own inner circle was actually coming to Gamla to support us and to say this is not about left or right this is not about politics this is about Israel's ability to defend itself and the historic uh, right that the Jews have to their land which I think should not have been an, uh, even an argument well at the end of this 19 day uh, hunger strike uh, and following the tremendous support that we received from, uh, as I said, all spectrum of the Israeli society, Yitzhak Rabin uh, made a move towards us, and he honored our effort, and he showed empathy towards the cry of the people of Israel, which uh, showed tremendous concern for this uh, peace treaty that's in the making. And uh, he made a promise, a public no, uh, promise, that if the agreement that him and Bill Clinton at the time are trying to push with Assad will come through and it will be agreed on, he'll bring that agreement to a national referendum where the Israeli people would have to say yes or no. And that I th we thought as the hunger strikers and with our leader Avigdor Kahalani, who is a very well-known figure in Israel, a great war hero, and uh, he was the official chairman of the entire effort because of who he is. Uh, we believe that this is a, a reasonable move by the Prime Minister and that we had to respond respectfully and make a move towards him. And we decided to end the hunger strike based on his promise that a referendum will take place if it will come to that. What we did not know, uh, Pastor Jim, is that uh, two days later, President Hafez Assad, the father of the present-day Bashar al-Assad. That's a Syrian dictator for this many a years. Very brutal uh, yes. Syrian uh, dictator, a terrorist, a drug dealer, and, uh, and a murderer of his own people. Like we're seeing with his son, he learned very well how to do this. Um, he canceled the uh, continued uh, phase of the negotiation with the Israelis because obviously being a brutal dictator that he is, Assad, he did not believe Rabin's sincere intention that he needs to work within a democratic framework. He thought this is all staged. And he canceled the most uh, significant uh, diplomatic meeting that was supposed to take care ever between an Israeli and Syrian military dele delegation. And that meeting that was canceled in Camp David was supposed to happen uh, a couple of months after the hunger strike was canceled and was never reinstated to date. So I can uh, say that something that looked uh, almost pathetic, within 19 days, um, I'm, I'm not trying to take uh, personal credit here, we were a big uh, team over years and it involved hundreds of people. But at the end of the day, we have managed to derail a very dangerous plan. Of course, it was. it's always wrapped with the idea of peace and so forth, yeah. But uh, imagine we would have done that. Imagine Israel would have given the Golan Heights to Syria in 1994. I think everyone understands today that what we would have seen in the Golan Heights is not Syrians. We would have seen Iranian generals, like we do in Lebanon, and we would have seen Russian generals, like we do in Syria. Only now they can uh, uh, walk and scout and observe and plan and conspire from our own doorstep. The Golan Heights, like they're named, are a very high ridge that is giving Israel, even though it's small size, um, a great uh, military advantage and a great uh, uh, geographic buffer. We cannot lose it. We should not lose it. It is ours from uh, Talmudic times, from uh, more or less first century where the first synagogues were already built in the Golan Heights. And I think that it will relate to our conversation later. I think it's time to change the way we think about all this. Yes, and just to remind our viewers, this is what uh, Barack Obama was saying. Uh, we need to turn to pre-1967 borders. When Syria had the Golan Heights for 10 years, they did nothing but sit on that ridge and shoot artillery shells over the Galilee into Tiberias, it's, there's extremely, um, like you were saying, it would be like giving the Russians the Rocky Mountains. 
That's a that's and, a, and, the best a example sense. I can think of. Yes, and so they Syria had already proven what they would do with that yeah. with that uh, that land, and um, so it just it does it says a lot about what peaceful going with the peaceful protest uh, for starters how how things can get done with that, um, and uh, that, that's just just an amazing story. Um, he, you were thirty years old. Right, I, I was thirty. You were thirty then. at the time of the hunger strike. <laughs> yeah, and uh, pr- approximately two hundred, a quarter of a million uh, Israeli citizens came up uh, to support them at at Gamla, and and I think that when Rabin, the prime minister at the time, he saw that there was, it just put so much pressure on him, and now we still have the yeah. Golan Heights yeah. in Israel's. Um, but there's but there's uh, an, an an important lesson learned from that experience, and and I think it relates to all of us as people who are worried about our democracies, the countries we live in, you know, the Western culture and the Western civilization and democracies are threatened by uh, some kind of an ideological collapse uh, that is taking over. And I think that regardless of political affiliation, this is uh, something I want to highlight. It has nothing to do with politics. It has to do with our loyalty and our patriotism to our own country, not to a certain party or not to a certain man. We have to understand, and I'm, I'm an Israeli, so I'll talk about my, my role with this in Israel. We have to understand that we need to stop this polarization we need to stop this unnecessary hate towards the other or the other side and, and to constantly work at improving how nasty we can be towards that other side. And it doesn't matter from which side. What needs to be now is a focus on what, what makes us one unit, what makes us Jews in the land of Israel, one entity, focus on that and draw a line in the sand that enable once and for all a a wide national consensus inside Israel that these are our final borders. We never, ever walk away from them. And we are done. We are done making the mistake of leaving our borders all the time for negotiation or for up for grabs. That has to end. We are the only country in the world that has not declared its final borders. And I belong to the group of people in Israel, and I'm... Uh, we'll talk about building Israel later, um, that, that believes that this idea of leaving your borders up for grabs, yeah, our neighbors are not the Swiss and, and, and not the Canadians. Our neighbors is one and a half billion Muslims that want our land. And this uh, um, uh, leaving it up there for grabs is what's bleeding the Israeli-Arab conflict all the time. We have to stop this and claim this line or that line that's a job for experts and we're working on creating that that the the general guidelines to what those lines should look like but eventually god willing if we will have a a say in this someday there will be drawn lines of the final borders of israel drawn and we should be prepared as a people to defend them no matter what over time no matter how long it takes and this, I believe, um, will not be easy, but it will gradually correct the wrongdoings of the past 50, 60 years. Every time Israel went the way of land for peace, we ended up having less land and less peace. Yes, and, you know, on another note, in, well, and just and let me tell you, this Final Hour podcast tour to Israel, just quickly, and we'll get to this at the end, but in the Golan Heights, you're going to see three sites. If you come with us up there, three really key sites. And, and actually, we go to Gamla exactly where um, they did their hunger strike. And, you know, Gamla, it's, it's the Romans were fighting with the Jews. That's, that's what Gamla is. It's, it's, a, it's a site that's been around for, for thousands of years. And there's so much history there. So keep that in mind. But... On another note, in 2001, you were appointed by Ariel Sharon as a full-time advisor in the prime minister's office. Can you tell us about those days and your experiences? 
This was uh, definitely another highlight of my life. I'm very privileged. Um, I I believed in uh, 99 and uh, year 2000, I believed that Ariel Sharon is the man that can navigate Israel and lead Israel out of Arafat's lethal, um, brutal terrorist attack all over Israel. We all remember buses exploding, hotels exploding, cafes, uh, whole families being sprayed with bullets on the, ha on the roads on their way home or to work. It was a horrible time. And uh, I was uh, one that believed that I, I have to be active in trying to uh, uh, put Sharon in office. And uh, we succeeded in doing that. He won the election by a landslide. And really, to my surprise, and my, uh, uh, I was very humbled and honored, he called me up to his office about a month after he was elected, and he uh, more or less told me that I'm staying here <laughs> in the room. And uh, my task would be to handle all the uh, interreligious affairs in the prime minister's office because they are complex in a country like Israel. We need to be sure that we are in constant uh, uh, touch with the major Jewish organizations, with the leaders of the Jewish world worldwide, especially North America, England, France, the major Jewish communities. We still have Aliyah uh, issues of um, uh, finding those Jews that live in problematic uh, countries and helping them uh, come to Israel and make Israel their home. And I thought that was a, a huge opportunity for me to, uh, to also, and that, that comes to the Christian part of my title, not only world Jewish affairs, but also world Christian affairs. And the idea behind that was to make a statement that the Prime Minister of Israel, which is the official state of Israel, obviously, is highly interested in extending the, the hand of love and support and, and, um, and backing that Israel enjoys for decades from uh, wide circles in America, but also wide Christian circles in America. Not only the Jewish community supports Israel, of, of course, but millions and millions of uh, Christians or non-affiliated. There, We have a lot of friends. Our main problem is, uh, is uh, governments, I think, and uh, the political language with all, which always gets dishonest and hypocr hypocritic. But the people, uh, uh, the majority, yeah, are by far supportive of Israel. I think most people in the world, even in Europe, they understand the good guys and the bad guys situation here, to simplify it. Well, I found myself working with uh, one of the greatest men in Israel's history, a uh, four-star general who saved Israel in the Yom Kippur War, a great uh, field commander uh, on a, a division level, and uh, also a very... Um, a strong leader. Uh, I worked there for a year and a half uh, because I felt that what I'm doing is more important than all my personal affairs. I came to serve my nation, and that was all there's, there was to it. And I did my best to uh, be a servant to Prime Minister Sharon and a servant to these organizations and leaders around the world that found me a, 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 an available address to them to, to communicate with the Prime Minister or with the State of Israel. Fascinating time. Very busy, very uh, demanding, very intense. Unfortunately, about a year and a half later, uh, Sharon uh, chose to announce his supportive of uh, Palestinian statehood under very, very heavy conditions. Yeah, Not uh, that he wanted to do it, but he kind of paid lip service to the international community, community sort of saying, well, I would uh, welcome a Palestinian state if the Palestinians stop killing us. Uh, those games, you know, uh, as we can see, they didn't uh, succeed for Israel. Yeah? The Palestinians are not going to stop killing us. Uh, we're surrounded by, uh, by a major problem of countries and organizations that think that Israel will be just wiped out one day. And uh, I think Sharon made a mistake. As much as I love him, as much of, as I have personally uh, been inspired and learned from this man, you know, he's definitely a giant of a man. Of course, he passed away about uh, 12 years ago. 
But my point is that uh, a declaration of a Palestinian state is something that is not accept acceptable. We came to build the homeland for the Jewish people, not for the Palestinians. We came to claim our land, not some fictional propaganda um, claim that never even existed. You know, who are the Palestinian people? Who, who was their leader before Arafat? Where was the country called Palestine? Where is a Palestinian newspaper or currency or capital? There's no such thing. It is all a fraud. They are a part of the Arabs of the Middle East, no doubt. And there was a small group that used to live in Palestine of the late 1800s and early 1900s. But most of them came at the turn of the century because Israel started prospering and building roads and communities. And many of those Arabs came from Arab countries. They were not Palestinians when they immigrated. And they immigrated to find job opportunities like people do all over the world from time immemorial, wherever there's prosperity and a tailwind for constructions and agriculture and industries. You have to find cheap labor, a lot of labor. And, and uh, the Arabs started coming to work with the Jews, believe it or not, to build what Israel has become in 1948. But they came in such uh, massive numbers, and it remained the problem that we have today. Now, I want to stress one thing. There is no Israeli on earth that hates Palestinians. We don't hate Palestinians. We don't wish them away. We are looking, we're going to turn every stone to achieve peace, not only with the Palestinians, but with all our Arab neighbors. But I, I want people to be serious about this dialogue. This is not uh, something we can solve in slogans. This is a very complex issue and a precondition, a prerequisite for a successful dialogue between Israel and its neighbors, call them neighbors or enemy, I don't care, in the, in the realities and the culture of the Middle East, and a very big word here is culture, of, of what does it mean to sign a contract or an agreement. We have a problem with this. We signed many agreements with all sorts of Arab entities, and it did not uh, prove to be something that we can really uh, be accountable, the other side can be accountable for. We signed an, a peace agreement with Arafat, and within months he started blowing up buses all over Israel. So these are serious things, and what we need now to do is not keep on looking at the idea of appeasing the Arab side, or at appeasing the Palestinians, or appeasing the international community. We have done that for 60 years, and it's not working. We are all the time trying to show compromise and appeasement, thinking that maybe eventually we'll get some of that from the other side. We will never get it. It's a cultural, um, it's a, you remember in the old days of computer, it used to say syntax error if you, mm -hmm. if you typed something stupid. Uh, it's a syntax error. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. It's, a, it's mixing the wrong software with the wrong hardware. It's just not going to work. The hope for the Middle East is an Israel so strong that it deters war, because we, that war is, the, is a failure. War is when you were not strong enough to keep your enemies away. That's when a war starts. Look at Ukraine and Russia now. Imagine Ukraine had everything that was sent to them on day one of the war. The war might have not started. And this is exactly the same situation. Israel must maintain all those people that preach uh, peace to Israel. The first thing they need to do is to make sure Israel is the strongest power in the Middle East. That is the foundation for our ability to talk with our neighbors, whether it's the Palestinians or the Saudis or the Syrians someday when that uh, regime will disappear and there will be someone more civilized in Syria and so on. And it goes back to the idea of a final borders. Israel must determine its final borders and reach a hand to peace on one hand, but an iron fist to those that are trying to uh, throw rockets at our cities, penetrate through uh, tunnels, 
and uh, do all this drive-by shootings and so forth that we uh, we know of in Judea and Samaria that is that is actually getting worse in the past few months. And ironically, um, our temporary prime minister, Mr. Lapid, the one that we've had now for a few months, uh, he rushed to promise a Palestinian state. And since then, the terrorist uh, wave in Judea and Samaria went up 100%. We have to realize that there is a true cost on the, in reality to the words we speak. And if uh, think of it again in any other country. There, there, if, if America will project weakness, and again, I'm not getting into politics, I'm getting into, into the rules of life. If America will be weak, America will be attacked. Everybody understands that. So, so in a democracy... And in a free society, military strength is not about the Putins or the Iranians or the North Koreans that are evil in their core. It's about defense and being sure that you eliminate the, the, the boiling point called war. You do that by being strong first, not by offering your, your country away. Well, and just to remind you, you know, I, I remember I was I had the opportunity to go to the Gaza Strip um, before that Bush. I mean, I say that Bush gave it away. He pressured the Israelis into giving it away and um, down there. And, and I, there were beautiful greenhouses. It was very productive. Um, they had incredible uh, just f farming and everything. And, 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 and so Bush moves thousands of of Israelis from their homes, um, we get judged by Katrina, what a coincidence, uh, within weeks. But I will say that, the, you know, they, they, everyone says what a bad state they're in. They, they could have taken over that, the production of all of that, and they destroyed it. They burned it all to the ground, the Palestinians. Yeah. And as, as soon as the Israelis gave away that land down there, George Bush being behind it, um, the, the, what does the Israelis get? They did not get peace. They got 4,400 Qassam rockets launched from the Gaza Strip within the next 10 months um, that Correct. were launched into Israel. So this is what he's saying. And every time they do this, he was talking about Arafat, who was the leader and I believe the founder of the PLO, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Which is a terrorist organization. And, and, and it, it, it happens every time. You show weakness, you give it away. And it doesn't, it doesn't bring peace. It has never brought peace. That's why he's talking about real borders, right? And um, let me ask you, because the pressure comes, it, it seems to come always uh, from the French, from the British, from the UN. Um, how do you feel about all those powers that, that keep telling yeah. Israel what to do? Yeah. Well, I will, I will divide that list uh, that you mentioned. Uh, uh, um, the United States, England, uh, France, Germany, more or less all these um, strongest countries in the world. Yes. Uh, first of all, we need to put uh, that in order. These are our primary friends and our most important allies. Yes. Israel has a huge debt to the United States, and Israel has a huge debt to the, some European countries. I'm talking of the modern times of the past 50, 60, 70 years, especially America. Yeah, America has been a powerful supporter of Israel on all fronts. I, I don't want to even uh, take that away one bit. However, um, the mistake that the international community, the ones that's friendly to us, that I mentioned now, it keeps on doing, is that, you know, I used to describe it like there's a briefcase that says on it the, the Secretary of State. Uh, only the person carrying that briefcase is changing every now and then. But, but the idea in the briefcase, I'm talking of all American Secretaries of State. They are avid lovers of Israel and good friends of ours. But they're, they, they keep making the same mistake. They haven't updated the content of that briefcase in 60 years. And what's in that briefcase is one idea that fails all the time, is what Israel should give away in order to earn peace. We have to change that thinking. And I, and I, 
and uh, you mentioned my effort in Israel. We want an Israel that says to our friends, we have changed and you have to change also. Giving away our land is no longer the option that we're looking for. We, w we made a mistake trying it and we, the only good thing that came out of that is that we know we shouldn't continue trying it. We, it's time to change that. This is how Israel is going to be from now on. And you, our friends and close allies, stop mediating. Stop being equally nice to both sides. You have to take a stand. Israel does deserve the biblical and the pragmatic uh, present-day right to decide its borders by itself. Can you imagine that Israel would go to the United States or to Germany or to England and harass them all the time about their borders or their history or who they, what people they moved from place to place? This is not the way. The way is to create a cluster of Israel's supporters who understand the issue of the need to draw the final borders. And if... Uh, the anti-Israel groups or countries or, or terrorist organizations will not like it, so they will not like it. It's okay. <laughs> they, I don't see that they like everything today. Well, what are they threatening us with? Animosity? Terrorism? Rockets? They do it anyway. What, what, what are they threatening us with that they haven't done? They've been blowing our cities, cafes, restaurants, buses. What do we have to be afraid of? So we need to draw a line between Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, PLO, uh, Abu Mazen, all these uh, leadership groups and terrorist groups, and these ones have to be destroyed. The people, and that's what matters, the, 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 the Palestinian that gets up in the morning and wants to go to Israel because that's the only place he can go to safely, and work a day and come back and put food on the table. This is what life, we're losing touch with reality. There's people here that need to eat. And, and two million Palestinians are held hostage by Palestinian terrorism. When 1% when of the Palestinians inflict terrorism on Israel, the way Israel has to defend itself is inevitably harming all two million Palestinians. This is not what we want, and this is what we're going to change. We will hit the troublemakers, those who fund them, those who train them, those who hide them, and those who feed their uh, sick ideology. We're going to hunt them down and eliminate all of them. But we will also extend the hand of hope and peace to our Palestinian neighbors. We want to live with you in peace. That has to be a, a one uh, uh, statement. It's not living with you here to, to, to you blowing us up. It's to have peace and tranquility and safety for all. And Israel is strong enough to create that reality and to impose it. We don't need to negotiate anymore with anyone simply because of one reason. There's no one to negotiate with. Who are we going to negotiate with? The Palestinians are broken between uh, uh, Hamas Gaza and uh, Abu Mazen's group in Ramallah called PLO. Uh, the Sunni and Shiite world is in pieces fighting each other everywhere. Uh, all the Muslims that are being killed in the world today are being killed by Muslims. That's the reality. So they cannot get their act together between themselves. And, and so the UN, the European Union, and sometimes, unfortunately, even our allies like the United States, they think we're going to make peace with them. They can't have peace amongst their own brethren, let alone the atrocities and the beheading and the, and the religious fanaticism that this goes with. It's a very violent culture that we're in the middle of. And, and in that, we need to find the, the realistic, pragmatic partners and give them a better life because we're strong enough to do that, to create that reality. It's a change in the language, but it's, time, it's been time to change that decades ago. Wow, that's 
really, really in, insightful stuff. Um, how can Christians and Jews really, um, and really anyone else that loves and supports Israel's, Israel, how can, can they support your work in the land? Well, uh, first of all, the Jewish people invented prayer, <laughs> as you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really believe in it. We are uh, a people of eternity. We have walked this planet as a people for over 5,000 years, and we owe apologies to no one about uh, claiming our land. And people who get it, and people who want to be a part of the biblical prophecy, the, the, the beauty of the story of the Jewish people, there's beauty in all that. We, we tend to always talk about the bad things and the violence, but I think there is something very, very uniquely beautiful about the story of the Jews. You know, it's a people that have a Bible, a land, and the Lord as, as the symbol of what Jews stand for. It's a unique creation on a world uh, uh, level. There's no other society like the Jewish people in that regard. And the whole world knows it. Everybody knows the connection between the land of Israel, the Bible, and the Jewish people. Everyone. So when they speak about giving away land and so forth, it's just hip hypocrisy. It's not ignorance. Okay? Especially when it comes from Western world powers, like we mentioned. I think that, uh, um, first of all, any work that goes into Israel, visiting Israel, investing in Israel, of course, is always a great help. Anything that makes Israel stronger and, and feel encouraged and supported. And of course, uh, our organization, Building Israel, you can go on, uh, online on Building Israel, one word, buildingisrael.com. Go to our donate page. You can read a little bit about what we do, and you can also support us financially. We are determined to uh, uh, help the young uh, Jewish population of Judea and Samaria prosper and live in safety. They need everything. They need cameras. They need ambulances. They need fences. They need more electricity, more water in their communities. Um, you know, people call these places settlement. Um, settlements are a place where people settle to, to live and create a community, a tree, a garden, a kindergarten, a school, a hospital, um, and of course homes for families. That is a settlement. Uh, it comes out of the word of the Bible where Abraham, where Abraham has been ordered to settle the land. And the, that order was repeated to Isaac and Jacob later on, and, 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 and Joshua, of course, taking the land, and King David uh, building Jerusalem, and King Solomon building the temple. These are huge things in our history. It's, it's, it's not just a story in the Bible, yeah? These are things that happened. They are the, the footprints of the Jewish story. And here we are, like our prophets and kings say in the Bible, back to our homeland after a forced exile of 2,000 years. First, it was the Babylonians that kicked us away uh, to the east. Then it was the Romans that kicked us away to the west. And of course, the destruction of both temples by both these empires. Where are those empires today? I'm not sure. But I know where the Jewish people are. They're in Jerusalem. They're in the land of Israel. And Judea and Samaria are the epicenter. They are the stage of where the entire book of, of Genesis is taking place. You know, that's where, that's, where, that's where Shiloh is. Shiloh is where the Ark of the Covenant parked for 369 years. Uh, Joshua put it there. Before it was moved to Jerusalem. Um, I'm not sure there's many uh, world capitals that exist for 369 years today. Yeah? And then it was moved to Jerusalem, which has been the capital of the Jews since then. Yeah, over, uh, over 3,500 years, Joshua's time. And Joshua's altar and Hebron, where our forefathers are buried. You've been there in the cave of multiplication in the, uh, in the Hebron area. And Bethlehem. And, and, of course, Mount Moriah, where Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac. 
That's where the Temple Mount stood. So when you say Judea and Samaria, it's not a political term. It is the it is the birthplace, the cradle of the Jewish civilization and everything we are about. That someone will tell us is an occupied land. Who did we occupy it from? <laughs> Who did we occupy it from? I've, I've, <laughs> Who I've, was there? I've read a lot of. I'm reading. I'm in Joshua yeah. Sh again. Sh Shiloh. We go there. That's but right. we'll talk about that. So yeah, yeah. These are uh, you know we all know these things. Our enemies know these things, and that's why they're so busy with replacement theology, with BDS, with uh, bad mouthing Israel with uh, promoting the word apartheid and how many times have you heard that israel is an apartheid state mm -hmm. or that israel is is uh, an occupier these terms are being thrown casually by people who want to over time discredit and and take away from the uh, fact that israel belongs there and to portray us like the occupier but in reality, uh, the land of Israel should have been free of anyone. <laughs> and, and, and it was, you know, if you read uh, Mark Twain's uh, journal, uh, he traveled uh, Lebanon, Syria, and Israel of today back in 1864. There was no Palestinian issue back then because there were no Palestinians. And when he uh, visited, he documented his uh, trip at that time, there were maybe 150,000 residents in all the land of Israel. Today, there is 10 million, yes? So, in 150 years, uh, we know that that land has been basically invaded by uh, all sorts of people that came from all over the Middle East. And it started by them coming to find uh, work and job opportunities, labor and things like that, and it ended up being one of the most explosive problems in the world. Yes. But that should not make us waver and, and, and lose sight of what was the core of all this, how it was, and what will be. Israel will be the homeland of the Jews for forever, and it has to be no matter what it takes, because there's nowhere else, there's nowhere else that the Jewish people can go. And there's nowhere else the Jewish people will go. The Arabs have 22 countries, one and a half billion people. Israel has one little Israel that's the size of some ranches in Texas. <laughs> and, uh, and one state for the Jews. And still, in this country that Israel, that has been named by hate groups, you know, they name it an apartheid state and so forth. We have a 17% Arab minority. I'm talking now organic Israeli citizens, not Palestinians. I know it's a little confusing, but think of it that way. There's the Israeli Arabs, or Arabs who are Israelis like me. We have an Israeli passport, okay? the Palestinians have uh, a passport of the Palestinian Authority. Now I'm talking about those Israeli Arabs. They can uh, run for Knesset, and we have about 14 or 16 uh, Arab members of Knesset, sometimes 17, depends. We have Arab judges in our court system. Every hospital in Israel you walk into, about a third of the uh, doctors and the nurses are Arab Israelis, uh, Arab attorneys, Arab soccer players. I think that Israel, uh, it, now if you are a BDS or a Jew hater or an Israel hater, I have nothing to, 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 to say to you. But for those who really want to understand the picture for real, I really think that from a coexistence standpoint, what the Jews and Arabs of Israel has shown the world is nothing but a tremendous success. And people only hear the bad things. Israel is a symbol of ethnic coexistence. And most Arab Israelis, if not all of them, maybe they won't say it publicly. It's a cultural thing. But believe me, I live with the Israeli Arabs. 
uh, they're very happy that they were born in Israel and not in Saudi Arabia or in Syria or in Iraq or in Iran. Yeah, Israel is the only country in the Middle East where Arabs live in a democracy. So they will call us an apartheid state. How much hate and fiction and, and fraud there will be in this language and in all these terminologies that are aimed to weaken Israel, to discredit it, and to incite against it. And sometimes, unfortunately, it is very, very venomous and effective. But uh, my job is to put a mirror in front of people and to tell them, no, you cannot say that about us. You cannot call us, the Jews, occupiers in the land of Israel. And you can never, ever call us an apartheid state. Go to other places, see what apartheid looks like, not in Israel. Yes, and listen, on, on his organization, Ronnie's organization, Building Israel, we have got a links to that right now on the Living Word Facebook. Just You can reach us at Living Word Christian Center on Facebook or at on Instagram at Living Word MN, right? On, on, that's, on, that's on Instagram. And, you know, you just hit that link and it brings up uh, an introduction um, to, to his organization, um, which we're really excited about. Um, you, know, you, you know, do you feel like you've given our audience enough of an orientation on Judea and Samaria and, and what, it's, what it's all about and what's going on there? Or, I mean, do you have more? I just want to get everything that you've got. Um, I, it's, I, it's, I think, it's strategic. It's a strategic... Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's on the north and south side of Jerusalem, okay? It's, it's, um, this is not just somewhere off in the desert. This is key, a key, key piece it, it, it of It is land. 12 miles from Tel Aviv. Yes. It is right on the outskirts of Jerusalem. It's not somewhere out there. You're right. Yes, and, um, you know, about a year ago, I was at your home, um, met, met all your kids who I've known since they were born, they used to come on when we would come over there in these tours. They would just, he would just give our, give our kids to my mom, and they would come with us. Your son Yehuda was, was about to join the army. Um, I'd like to ask you, what, what is it like to have a mandatory army service and have everyone in that country have to send their kids into such a dangerous and demanding service? Yeah. Well, I will, I will try to answer as an Israeli statesman, not as a father. Because <laughs> as a father, I'm counting the days for his uh, military service to uh, be over. He has two more years. Mm -hmm. We're very proud. He chose a very demanding um, a protocol. He volunteered to a uh, Corps of Engineering uh, unit of the IDF. It's, uh, you, can all, you can probably call it a commando unit that specializes in... Uh, all sorts of uh, specialty kind of warfare. I don't want to get into too many, many details, but very good unit, very good commanders, very good uh, friends in the unit. And he, he looks great. He feels uh, that he's doing something important. On the national level, you know, we're, we're all family people. We all have a, a heart for uh, the young generation. I am proud that these are the choices that our young uh, generation makes. Uh, they come under law, but they come as volunteers. And they come with a tremendous motivation to serve the, the country, a very high level of, uh, of uh, their fighting on, on spots in the most uh, demanding units. Uh, from Navy SEALs to jet fighter pilots and to very, very uh, elite units that they're uh, on each spot. There is a thousand competing. They want to get there to the best places and the most demanding ones. So on, on, the, on the national level, uh, I, will, I will quote a, a friend of my dad's that uh, said something nice that I remember to me many, many years ago. He said, we're all fighting. We're all warriors fighting but we are pacifists we're we're pacifists we're people of peace we don't want any of that we don't want any bullet fired ever again 
on any side ever anywhere in the world this is elementary a jewish value and christian we are people of peace and respect to the other but unfortunately we are again we are in the mouth in the shark's mouth we are surrounded by a pretty violent environment that wishes our away, us away and is, is firing at us. It's not an, just an ideological war here. It's, it's a war of rockets being fired on cities, tunnels that are being prepared to storm our villages, insane things. And, and we have no choice but to defend our, ourselves. And, and my father was a colonel in the uh, Israel Defense Forces. He was in the paratroopers. I, uh, uh, as you mentioned, I was in uh, an infantry unit, a very known one. I was in Golani and Givati. I spent most of my military service in Lebanon, defending northern Israel. And now my son is already a, a third generation to a levy um, that's uh, um, in the army, prepared to do whatever it takes to defend our country. So again, on the, on the eye level, contact, when you see these young men, uh, something in your heart breaks that we need to um, put out that effort and that risk and that price. But as a society, I think it is also galvanizing us unites us and gives our young generation an experience that is uh, priceless uh, it's like five universities put together to be in the army and um, i'm i'm praying every morning psalm 91 over the soldiers of the israel defense forces in the air in the sea and on the ground it's our children all of them all of them and we can't have any one of them hurt and all the, they will do their part, and then will come the next generation. That's life, and we need to face it, not to whine about it. And I think that Israel has done a good job in opening the army ranks to men and women and gay and all, all people who, who feel that they are patriots who want to serve the nation. That is a good thing for the society. I wish that... Maybe the day will come, and like the prophet says, we will turn our uh, uh, swords into shovels. Amen. It, well, the Bible says it's coming. Yes. So the Israel's going nowhere. Yes. And we will achieve it by, by uh, sticking to who we are, not by folding our flags. That's right. Yeah. Well, if we fold see. our flags, we will never get rid of the sword, mm. and we will never see the shovel. If you fold your flag, they're going to run you into the exactly. Into the they're going to chase you. And um, I just wanted to, because you have you have so much insight. Um, do you have? You know, we we try to share updates. Uh, it's very, uh, it's a tough situation over there. You got the Russians with a with a naval base, the Iranians with not just a militia, but they've there's been members of their Republican Guard that we know that have been killed. Um, through the bombing on the outskirts of Damascus. Is there anything, any update with, because it's almost something new almost every week. Yeah. You know, if you're really paying attention to that. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's an ongoing uh, um, tragedy for us and a, a great challenge for the Israeli um, intelligence community and to the Israeli Air Force primarily. Um, we have a... Think of it, I will metaphorically say, there's a six-lane highway that goes between Iran and Lebanon. And two-thirds of that highway go through Syria. When I say highway, I mean that metaphorically. It can be all sorts of routes that the Iranian are find, Iranians are finding out, some by sea, some by air, some by land. There's channels that they are constantly trying to create to bridge the gap called Syria and have all their weaponry shipped to the Hezbollah in Lebanon. Hezbollah uh, is a proxy of Iran. Hezbollah does, is not independent to do whatever it wants. It was independent to destroy Lebanon, but it's not independent to attack Israel. When and how 
Hezbollah operates with Israel is decided in Tehran, not in Beirut. And so uh, hitting that six-lane highway, cutting it, damaging it, and, and targeting anything that flows through it is almost a daily, as you can tell in the past two, three years. It's almost, uh, there's not a week without uh, some kind of an explosion that's taking place in hangars, in airports, in highways inside Syria. And uh, my guess is that this is a part of uh, our effort uh, to uh, not allow the Hezbollah to um, uh, develop growing uh, capabilities that are uh, more and more serious for us to, to deal with. We have no choice but to attack Iran. Uh, there is a war between Israel and Iran already going on for years. And, and, and it's mainly in that theater, on the, on the uh, channels that flow between Iran and Lebanon, which is where Syria has a big, uh, obviously a big chunk. But there's also other channels. There's the cyber um, uh, platform where the Iranians are very active. Israel needs to invest many resources to defend itself in the cyber space from Iranian uh, hacking and attacks of all sorts. And uh, there is Iranian uh, maritime effort, ships that are trying to send uh, rockets to Hamas in Gaza and to Hezbollah in Lebanon, sometimes through very exotic uh, tricks that they try to pull off to trick us, like sending things to Sudan and from Sudan through Egypt. And they're trying everything they can. So far, uh, we've been very effective in uh, derailing a lot of that but probably not all of that. And uh, there are, uh, it's a war of attrition. It will go on a long time. Uh, we're getting a better at this. I think they're getting better at this. And it's uh, very unfortunate that uh, this is an effort that Israel is more or less alone in. Yes, know. yes, yeah. all alone. Yeah. Um. And, and now we have to attack Iran inside Syria and make sure we don't upset the Russians that are in Syria. Uh, you couldn't make up that whole, you know, it's like such a mess. And, and to operate in this and to target your priorities and, and be okay with the limitations is a very complex art in itself. Thank God we have the military muscle that can facilitate the intelligence and uh, deliver the tactical answers. Yes, uh, possibly the best Air Force in the world, um, you know, probably. Um, I, I hope so. <laughs> yes, yes, to deliver, to deliver what needs to be delivered. Um, you know, and again, um, shamelessly, uh, I'm promoting the tour in November of 2023, um, and we'll get that information out to you, but um, uh, you'll see, you'll get to stand on, on this tour. It's a different kind of tour, you know. Uh, you'll stand on it was a mis miskabam, and you look over into Lebanon, yeah. and you get to see. You might see. There has been times in the eight or nine times I've been been there and looked over, where pointed out they they may wave at you. They're, they're yeah. just right across the border. It's, it's a very, you get to see all these things. These things come alive, the reality of what he is saying. Um, you get to see, you get to stand there and see how these communities have to be on constant alert, constant alert, and constantly be paying attention. And they live like this is how they live. And so, um, and going into that, um, I'm excited uh, because Ronnie, um, I hope I say this right, but on the side, he, he's always had, uh, uh, this is who, uh, we, the, it's through his company that we booked this tour in November 2023, and we will get you the dates, and there will be a place on the Final Hour podcast website where you can be the first ones to receive the information. If you go on the website, you're going to see it. Just sign up, and as soon as we get the information, uh, these new global passports. Have you heard about that? 
the global passports. That I, the, I heard something. I don't, so I, sure. I want to find out as much as I can find mm -hmm. out uh, in regards to that. Um, but I'm excited about this tour that we're going to be taking. And we we're at dinner last yeah, night. That's right. Um, talking about it because he's in general, in general, it's his people that organize this tour. It's his company. Am I okay to say that? Of course. You yes. know, it's, uh, this is a part of, of what I do because um, beyond of it, uh, you know, it's been a business, but uh, it's a business with a mission. I believe that um, we didn't talk about this much today, but maybe if you will invite me again, we get a chance to talk about the Christian Jewish Alliance, Yes, which is really uh, something I've been promoting for many, many years. I believe that... Um, Differences between religions and between people are a good thing if, if there is mutual respect. And I think there is a lot of mutual respect between Jews and Christians. I think a lot of Christians acknowledge and understand the Judeo-Christian foundation of the Christian faith. And uh, also the faith in the Bible and what it says for Israel and for the land of Israel and so forth. And so I'm, I'm an agent for promoting that idea that Jews and Christians, despite of differences, have much more in common. We are uh, being threatened by the same powers. It doesn't matter on which level. And I think that working together on the thing that unites us, like Kufi and Christians United for Israel, like this ministry, like others that you know I've been involved with for so many years, and the visits to Israel is an opportunity for us Israelis to, to take all the things that we talked about today and show you. Show you, like you said, Mizgavam and the Hezbollah. And then you drive to the east 20 minutes and you can see Israel and Syria. And then you drive a little more south, another 40 minutes, and you can see Israel and Jordan. And then if you bother to drive all the way down south, you will see Israel and Saudi Arabia, and then Israel and Egypt. And it's such a tiny country, has these borders, and, and the Mediterranean on one side. So at least on the Mediterranean, we don't have an Arab country on our side. <laughs> but we have an, but it is a, have zoo a gateway. Out there. It's we, a zoo in the Mediterranean, though. We it? have a gateway to the world through the Mediterranean. Yes. But the environment around us, is very, very tough and very um, um, violent even, I should say, of course. To come to Israel, I think, is, a, is different than going anywhere else in the world because it's where, uh, Jew or Christian, it's where we meet our heritage, our history, and really the cradle of, of civilization, and, and for sure, biblical civilization. This is where it all happened. These are the places that, that the pages of the Bible speak to you from, and you see them come to life. And we're very proud to show also the achievement of what Israel did in, in 75 years, turning uh, sand dunes into being one of the most innovative societies in the world and leader in sciences and agriculture and high-tech and medicine and so many important fields. We are a world power when it comes to technology and, and research. And we're very proud of that. And uh, this is despite of a staggering uh, ongoing security cost that we were able to develop all these good things. And so I'm proud to take people around Israel and show them the, what, what our people made out of this country in 75 years. I wish our neighbors would have focused on things like that rather than how to kill me and my children. You know, when Ariel Sharon pulled out of Gaza, um, people like me that thought it is a tragic mistake um, were hoping that maybe we are wrong. I, I, I knew it was a mistake, but I was hoping I'm wrong. How, how could you be wrong? Well, here is Israel pulled out of Gaza, pulled out of Gush Katif, took out all the Jewish residents by force, and gave the Palestinians what they said they always wanted. The 1967 line in Gaza. That's 50% of the Palestinians found themselves overnight, no occupation, no Israeli army, no nothing. Palestinians running Palestinians. 
Well, it started with Hamas throwing the PLO guys from rooftops and killing them, their own people. And, and they turned the Gaza Strip into one big bunker. Now, now let's go back in time to 2005 when this was done and imagine that the Palestinians would have created nice beaches and resorts and an airport and better schools and better, better roads. Every single Palestinian could have been driving a Mercedes today if the Hamas would have taken all the, mo the money they spent on tunnels and rockets and, and put it into people's education and health system and welfare. They have a strategy of making their own people miserable so they are weak to revolt and so they hate us. That's, that's what they do. The, the Arab world is drowning in money. We all know that. Look at the projects they built everywhere in, in the, in the uh, Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia. The most outrageous uh, construction in the world is happening in those places. There's no budgets. There's no limitations to the insanity of the wealth that these countries have. And yet they all the time wave the flag of the Palestinian misery. What did they do for the Palestinians? How, wh why are they giving money to Hamas to build more ro uh, rockets? Why is there not schools and football stadiums and highways? And if that's what would have happened, then it could have been a good argument to say, well, you see, we moved out, they came in, they made it also a blooming garden like we did. Uh, they turned it into hell. Gaza is hell. But it's hell ran by Hamas. Lebanon is hell ran by Hezbollah, which Iran controls. Syria is hell. More than a million Syrians murdered and killed in fights between Assad and the rebels. So, you know, the Palestinian issue is the smallest problem that the Arab world has. <laughs> Yet it, it's used to be portrayed as if it's the mother of all problems. It's a lie. It's all uh, staged to bash Israel and to take the spotlight away from their corruption, from their murderous culture, from the wars they have between them. Israel did nothing to complicate the Arabs amongst themselves. It's an, it's an Arab Muslim thing. We can't, we, we didn't start it. We cannot end it. It's their thing. So why, why are you like that amongst yourself? It's a culture we're surrounded with. And, and back to Building Israel, our organization, www.buildingisrael.com. Please go online and support us because I believe that we're going to put this truth in front of as many people as we can and also with a pragmatic plan of how to change that reality. Yes, and... When you take that 2023 20, November tour to Israel with the Final Hour podcast, you will get a chance to see what exactly what building Israel is doing in Judea and Samaria and the, the, full, the full aspect of that vision. Right. And so I We'll just, show you the vineyard that we planted. You know, Jeremiah 31 5 says, Again, thou shalt plant vineyards in the hills of Samaria. It doesn't say West Bank. It doesn't say settlers. It doesn't say settlements. It says, again, thou shall plant vineyards in the hills of Samaria. And this is what we do because it, uh, we believe it uh, helps increase in the most effective way the Jewish footprint in Judea and Samaria. We need to claim that land, expand it, and apply Israeli sovereignty over those hills. And when you come with your uh, friends from America on this tour, as you know, I like to uh, hop on the bus every now and then and, yes. and, and give my briefings. And uh, we'll do that in, in uh, the Golan Heights and in Gamla, where, where the hunger strike took place, but also in Judea and Samaria and show you our projects yes. and what we do there to allow people to, to, to expand that footprint and to live uh, a better life. And these are the highlights uh, in these tours. Is I can honestly say it's with the Valley of Tears. You know, you go through uh, uh, a little bit of history lesson: um, <laughs> the Romans and the Jews, the Syrians and the Jews. Um, and Ronnie takes us through this personally 
and um, he's such a gifted public speaker. I, I you know, when you, you you've got to be in town for that tour <laughs> when we're there because yeah. that is that is one of the highlights of the tour is getting to hear him speak and talk about these things. And so it, today has been truly a blessing. Um, Thank and, you. Um, I, I pray that uh, 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 that you guys look up um, Building Israel, check it out, and um, watch watch where this thing goes in the future because it is only going to grow. It is only be- but going to become uh, a very big thing, um, and I know that in my heart. And I, I just I want to thank Ronnie Levy. I want to thank our producer. Thank you, JD. And um, I want to thank you guys, all our viewers, all our subscribers, all over the world. Again, thank you, New Zealand. I saw that we were trending very, uh, very well over in New Zealand. I just, uh, I appreciate you so much. It is an honor to be able to do this. And please, please subscribe. It helps us. Please subscribe to the Final Hour Podcast. God bless you. Thank you.